Thank you very much for uh, for joining us this morning. My name is Tim Boersma. Uh, I'm a uh, senior research scholar with the uh, Center on Global Energy Policy here at Columbia. Um, this morning we're going to talk about the uh, the role of the European Union in global energy transition uh, with a set of uh, a, a very distinguished uh, speakers, I should say. I'm very pleased to, pleased to have them all. I will introduce them to you in a second. Um, before I do that, let me first quickly say that this event, uh, like all of those at the center, um, is being webcast live, uh, and both the vi full video and the podcast um, will be uh, will be available on our website and on iTunes uh, somewhere in the coming days. Uh, and for those of you watching online, and I know that there are quite a few, um, uh, uh, as well as people here in the audience, of course, you can ask a question uh, to the panelists at any point dur during the event uh, using the hashtag CGEP events, and our Twitter handle is at Columbia U Energy. So after uh, having said that, uh, we'll start this morning's uh, event with a brief discussion with uh, European Commission Vice President Mara Sefcovic, um, who oversees the Energy Union, about which uh, he'll tell you more in a second. Um, he's had a very long and distinguished career uh, in public policy, both in Brussels uh, and on behalf of his home country, the Slovak Republic. Um, we're very honored, uh, sir, to, to welcome you here to Columbia University. Um, uh, and then after our conversation, I'll introduce our uh, distinguished other speakers and panelists uh, who will then comment on various parts of, uh, of Mr. Sefcovic's remarks. Uh, and then we'll turn to the audience and folks watching online uh, for, for Q&A. So, um, so again, uh, Mr. Sefcovic, um, welcome to, uh, to Colombia. Let us start maybe with, uh, with the geopolitics of energy in the European Union. Um, please tell us what, you know, in your view, the, uh, the, the key challenges are that, um, that Europe faces, um, how the changing energy landscape is affecting those challenges, um, and what uh, your, may I say, magnum opus, the energy union, um, is going to contribute um, to address some of those challenges. Well, thank you very much, Tim, and thank you for kind invitation to Columbia University, but also for um, sitting in such a distinguished panel, and I'm very much looking forward to our discussion and also uh, to the questions we'll get from the audience or online. And of course, this uh, question, it's quite, uh, quite large. And when we've been preparing the program for the current European Commission, it was quite clear that we need a completely new approach uh, to, the, to the energy as such. Because before that, I think uh, a lot of European policies and I think a lot of national policies uh, suffers a lot if you really narrow your focus on energy only, then you try to somehow accommodate it with our climate challenges, then later on you realize mm, we need to do something with transport, and then you have another minister who is responsible for research and innovation, and then of course you hit uh, the, the trade uh, barriers and then you can go on and on and on. So what we did uh, differently this time was that uh, we put uh, all the departments and all the commissioners who have uh, something to say in uh, this very important uh, process of uh, uh, energy transition, which we very much see as a part of uh, European uh, uh, modernization effort, very much linked uh, with the industrial revolution we are going through, and created the project team for the energy union. And you probably would be surprised, so I have 15 colleagues of mine, 15 commissioners who are helping me to deliver on that project. And uh, we also made it quite uh, quite clear that after the very thorough analysis, we need to work on what we call the five dimensions of the energy union. And first, what to do with energy security. And mm -hmm. it was actually the dimension which was very understandable, especially for the heads of states and government from Central and Eastern Europe, because they still have quite vivid memories on uh, interruption of gas supplies in, uh, from 2009, which was very, very difficult for, mm -hmm. the, for the whole region. Then, of course, uh, the, the second, uh, a dimension which was very important for all EU member states was that we started as a coal and steel community. So the, the energy was kind of at the birth of the EU, but until today we cannot say that we have single market in Europe for mm -hmm. energies because there is a lot of administrative barriers, there was a lack of infrastructure and, uh, and it was quite clear that we need to improve this hardware and the software of Europe to make sure that energy could flee, uh, could, uh, could circulate freely across the borders and at the same time that it would have appropriate rules which would govern uh, these, these uh, flows of energies. And then, of course, it was our climate agenda, because it was quite clear that uh, the decisions uh, we make today would definitely affect uh, how the European energy landscape would see in 20, 30, 40 years. So the decisions uh, have to be very much uh, 
um, um, already in line with uh, what we would like to see in Europe in 2030 or in 20, 2050. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we also um, made a huge focus on energy efficiency, moderation of uh, energy consumption, uh, because just let's use one, one figure only, 1% 1 of energy efficiency gain in Europe means that you can import uh, less 2.7 percent of gas so if you if you increase it uh, by five or ten percent which i know that it's, it's enormous effort so you see what kind of difference does it make and how closely it is linked with energy security and of course the the the, the last dimension upon which i, I was uh, very grateful to, to jonathan and secretary monitz uh, we've been cooperating very very closely on energy uh, innovation, the, uh, the, the, the research, scaling up uh, of some of the projects, better integration of uh, renewables into the system. So this is what uh, we presented uh, as, a, as, a, as a strategy uh, to help us to transform the energy landscape within, within the Europe, but at the same time to find for, I would say, the new geopolitics uh, which are affecting us uh, a lot. What are the major uh, challenges? Of course, it's still the situation to the east of our borders, mm -hmm. uh, the geopolitical tension uh, on the eastern Ukrainian border, uh, this very complex uh, relationship with, uh, with, uh, with Russia. Then, of course, uh, the instability in the Middle East, the, the whole Mediterranean basin where we are, of course, uh, looking for the ways how to stabilize uh, the region, how to, uh, how to um, introduce more effective uh, uh, policies uh, concerning migration pressures, but also the migration, uh, migration, uh, migration flows and, uh, and help uh, those who really need it uh, and are victims of the, of the war conflict uh, in Europe. And then, um, of course, the new situation in the United States. Now I'm, I'm, I'm glad to say that after a few weeks, uh, I think, uh, and after uh, the very intense uh, contacts which have been established between the EU and the uh, United States. We understand each other better, and I believe that we will continue in this, what was very important, uh, transatlantic relationship for, for, the, for the last decades, and I'm sure that we will be discussing a lot of things from security down to the, uh, down to the climate, uh, climate change, uh, where, as we, as we see, we have different approaches. And mm -hmm. I was yesterday, I spent the whole day in... Uh, in um, uh, Sustainable uh, Energy for, for All uh, Forum. And uh, there is, I would say, such an overall uh, regret about the rolling back of some of the policies uh, which uh, the US uh, brought to the table uh, to Paris, which was a historic milestone in tackling the climate change. But at the same time, it was, it was quite clear that uh, we would do our utmost to, to cooperate with the United States. But if it comes to the leadership, on fighting against climate change. So it's quite clear it will be uh, now definitely much more with, with, with us in, uh, in Europe. We will be working very closely with partners like China. I have a big faith in new actors who are more and more uh, influential uh, in this uh, uh, climate debate. So these are mayors, these are cities, because they are the first to uh, to react to air pollution, traffic congestions, and they have a lot of powers, and very often they are much more ambitious than, uh, than the national governments. But the dynamics which we had in Paris, this high ambition coalition, I think it's, it's, clearly, it's mm. clearly changed, and we'll see how that would evolve. So for not speaking too long, these are just some of the glimpses when in uh, the, the uh, and I didn't mention Brexit, which is, of course, something mm. which will keep us busy for, for at least, at least next uh, next uh, next two years so i mean as you see that i mean we are also having um, quite an exciting time in europe as well yeah hmm. yeah no that's that's evident you also you also didn't mention Nord Stream 2 which i applaud is it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> something that that tends to come up in these discussions as well we'll we'll get to that later um, you you mentioned the climate leadership and 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 as you as you say the mood has changed in in washington dc um, uh, um, a lot of this remains to be seen how it how it plays out you mentioned new actors um, what about other countries? Um, uh, climate leadership under China, uh, under Chinese uh, Chinese climate leadership, I should say, is maybe not the same as as, as we experienced with the United States in recent years, or maybe it is. Um, but but what do you? How do you foresee this playing out? What what sort of coalitions um, do you do you hope or or anticipate will emerge going forward, and how will that impact uh, the, the the challenge that, that lies ahead? I think that uh, I would say such a palpable. Uh, 
change was already felt in uh, in, in Marrakesh, the previous uh, yeah. COP, where it was quite clear that the uh, U.S. will not pursue uh, the, the climate agenda with the same fer same same energy as before. And I, I can tell you that we haven't uh, re received so many phone calls, letters, been approached by so many countries uh, since that moment, uh, telling us, uh, please, Europeans, continue, go ahead, do it. I mean, uh, we very much, very much need your leadership uh, uh, in, in this fight against climate change. And one of the partners uh, who was very first uh, uh, to talk to us and offering very close uh, collaboration on this was China. Mm -hmm. So I think that if it comes to the, to the major economies, uh, uh, most probably this will be the uh, European Union and China, which would really uh, uh, push forward, I would say, all these uh, big debates. But what I want to say is that I really, really believe that uh, Paris Agreement was a milestone mm -hmm. and that uh, these 100... Uh, 95 parties mm -hmm. who, uh, uh, if you put beside the United States, uh, uh, are fully committed to this process and uh, they, uh, they are going to, to implement uh, uh, these policies. Of course, with the United States in this uh, leadership group, it would be much easier because the, the voice would be stronger. We would be able to, to help mm -hmm. many more countries. Um, uh, together, because we are going to continue to be the biggest uh, uh, development aid uh, provider. We are going to spend more than 20% of uh, all our money on, on renewable energies. We are going to share our, our know-how uh, with, uh, with African countries, with developing world. But of course, with such an important partner like, like United States, we could, we could achieve much more. And that, that's a little bit uh, what uh, would be the major effect, that how fast and how profoundly we can implement uh, the uh, the policies which we agreed uh, uh, to in in uh, in Paris, if uh, United States would not be as active as uh, yeah. uh, as, uh, as as before, yeah. but otherwise, uh, uh, I think that there will be several factors which will be pushing us very much ahead. Uh, I think the fact that uh, climate change is, is accelerating, I think we see it on the weather weather patterns, uh, and we see how big areas of, in particular, Africa are less and less livable. Mm -hmm. We see a uh, new phenomenon, which is uh, uh, clearly described by, by the socialists as a, as a, as a, as a climate uh, uh, migration. And of course, if it comes uh, to, the, to, the, to the cities, uh, uh, again, this winter was a bit uh, special in this respect, uh, that uh, we had probably the worst uh, uh, numbers if it comes to the, to the air, air pollution, also in Europe since, since many years. So, I mean, the pressure on the mayors and pressure the mayors put on the, on, on, on the governments is quite strong to act, to come up with the, with the, with the, with the uh, cleaner solutions, cleaner policies. And I think this would be um, uh, uh, the, the drivers from the, I would say, perspective of the future quality of life. But also what I think the, it's, it's a new aspect is that uh, the investors and businesses are realizing uh, what kind of business cases mm -hmm behind uh, going for these new technologies, that they do not want to be left behind on this cutting edge innovations, on the fact that uh, this low carbon transition is very closely linked uh, with the industrial revolution. It's very closely linked with modernization of the systems, that companies want to be energy efficient, companies uh, want to have a good reputation, that uh, uh, they're using renewable energy, that uh, they're, they're helping environment. And this is actually, I would say, also one of the uh, reason why uh, top companies also in in US are pushing for US to stay within the Paris framework. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe maybe briefly, um, it'd be helpful if you can lay out. I mean, we talked about international coalitions. Um, what about domestic coalitions? It's not as if within the EU uh, there is there is one voice that is easy to streamline, and uh, so you have to you navigate that space too and try to get everyone uh, on the same page and formulate ambitions together. Can you maybe elaborate, talk a little bit about the challenges you face there? Uh, within Europe? Yeah. yeah, I think, uh, uh, of course, I mean, an Energy Union um, project uh, was and is very much supported by the EU member states because it offer, uh, I would say, the different solutions for different regions. Right. Because if you if you talk to Nordic countries, and I was the last week in, in Sweden, and what they do in Sweden is just absolutely remarkable. If you look, they already now, they, they have 99% uh, of energy uh, production from 
from low carbon mm -hmm. sources. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that will be for sure 100 percent uh, low carbon. I mean, within within a uh, couple of uh, couple of uh, couple of years. When you see that, uh, that they have biggest proportion of renewables in transport and what they do with heating and cooling, how innovative they are and uh, how they're using the, the data centers, uh, subway and, uh, and uh, uh, all uh, the energy intensive uh, factories that should collect the heat and, and heat the, 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 the whole mm -hmm. cities. It's just absolutely remarkable. And <coughs> it just proves that the technology is here. And when I was... Uh, in uh, Ume, which is a city in the north of Sweden, mm -hmm. there was still a lot of snow on Friday. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, they can, when they can be uh, so energy efficient in, in up there, you know, where it's uh, very, very cold for a long period of time, I'm sure that the technologies could be used anywhere in, in Europe, anywhere in the world. So mm -hmm. for Nordics, it's very much renewables, how to integrate them more efficiently, how to make sure that uh, the market works. For Central Eastern Europeans, it's of course still more energy security, uh, uh, also uh, also energy poverty. Mm -hmm. uh, more than 10% of people still have a problem to pay for the bills of the energy prices as, uh, as such. For Southeast Europe, this is lack of interconnections, uh, how to make sure that they will not be dependent on the one supplier mm -hmm. uh, only. For, for uh, Spain and Portugal, how to build the interconnection through France to make sure that mm -hmm. we can use their potential in renewables, that we can use the LNG terminals to get uh, the gas uh, to Europe. So each of them has, of course, a little bit different priorities, which we try to accommodate mm -hmm. within that uh, uh, European cooperation. And then, of course, you see a different uh, uh, accents when we are discussing the legislation. So we, if it comes to energy and climate policies, we put on the table everything including the new electricity market design. The last thing which we will present this year is uh, a big package on the low carbon mobility. But if it comes to energy, climate, all this transformation which you want to achieve, it's on the table. And you see that in some Central European countries there is big worry because you want to phase out regulated prices. Mm -hmm. In, uh, in another country, there is a worry that uh, through our governance system, we, we try to impose the energy mix upon them, which is not the case, but you know, the, the worries are there. Then of, also in, in countries like, like Germany, uh, they are a little bit worried, you know, that how this agency for the European regulators would work and who would have the last word on price zones and things like that. So, so I don't want to say that it's a just absolutely smooth ride. I mean, it's, uh, it's very... Uh, demanding what we do. It's, uh, I, I don't think then I'm exaggerating, but what we are really proposing, especially in our clean energy for all packages, the most profound uh, uh, transformation of energy systems in Europe since they have been built in the current cent uh, centralized and fossil based uh, uh, way. So we are completely changing the paradigm and it requires a lot of effort, a lot of negotiations, but I believe we will get there. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Um, final question, and then we turn to the uh, turn to our panelists. Um, you mentioned uh, African countries, um, and there's so there's this European African partnership under has been underway for some time, I believe, um, where European institutions help various countries in Africa increase energy access and so on and so forth. Can you maybe say a few words about that yeah. partnership? I think a lot of uh, of what we do there is already know, as I said, that we are the the, the largest official mm -hmm. aid donor. We have a very close partnership uh, uh, with uh, Africa. Uh, and uh, to that, I would say, traditional close partnership, we want to bring a new element. Because we realize that, uh, of course, uh, the future will be very much decided uh, how much we can uh, power Africa. Mm -hmm. How can we make sure that the 700 million Africans would finally get access mm -hmm. uh, to electricity? And how they are going to do it? Because if they would uh, follow our, let's say, fossil way, so then it would be tragedy for Africa because of the air pollution, because of the huge cost they would have to build to these big power plants and centralized power lines. And, and I served in Africa, uh, so mm -hmm. I know that in, in most of these countries it's almost impossible because of security, because of, uh, uh, of course, na uh, natural <coughs> conditions and so on and so forth. So what we would like to propose and develop together with them is uh, to kind of jump over the fossil age as much as they, as they can mm -hmm. and go straight to this decentralized microgrids uh, to build the, 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 the smaller system, especially in rural areas based on renewables, which would do the same trick and not that costly. And with today's technologies, I mean, you can build it very quickly and you can provide the, the electricity for the people who live there. And of course, you need money for that. So we, we learned uh, from what we call the Juncker Investment Fund, which is more or less uh, 
risk sharing facility mm -hmm. where we are telling the investors uh, if you see the higher risk project so we are ready to go for it with you and we will guarantee you that if you will have first eventual loss we will cover it mm -hmm. And it helped us to, uh, within one year to mobilize more than 160 billion euros for different infrastructural projects in, uh, in Europe. And we want to do the same in Africa. And we are going to work with the European Investment Bank, with development banks, and we hope, depending of course how much seed money we can push into the system, how much the member states or other countries would work with us. But our ambition is to build an investment fund which would be there between 30 to 40 billion uh, euros, where we can uh, use that money for promotion of exactly uh, this type of uh, new uh, energy projects, mm -hmm. which could, uh, I'm sure, uh, help Africans and completely change the way how they live, uh, how they produce energy and develop uh, 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 new businesses in, yeah. uh, in, in, in that continent. Okay. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Um, well, let me, turn to, uh, let me turn to our panelists. I'm going to introduce them to you. Um, and then we'll hear from them subsequently. Um, first, um, uh, to my left, uh, Natasha Udensifa, who's a lecturer here at SIPA uh, and managing partner at Eurasia Energy Associates. Um, she specializes, it's all in the name, I guess, in Eurasian Energy, energy Affairs. Um, then to far right, uh, Professor Vijay Modi, uh, who's a professor of mechanical engineering at Columbia uh, and specializes in energy sources and conversion, uh, heat mass transfer and fluid mechanics. Uh, and he has a lot of experience. I didn't, you came up with that bio. I didn't. <laughs> uh, has a lot of experience doing research uh, in developing countries uh, around the world. And then finally, uh, John Elkind, uh, who recently joined us as a fellow and adjunct senior research scholar at the Center on Global Energy Policy. Um, uh, he joined the center after uh, an impressive career devoted to energy and environmental policy, most recently as uh, Assistant Secretary for International Affairs at the US Department of Energy. So we're very delighted to have the three of you join us. Uh, in arbitrary sequence, I'm going to turn to Natasha first for some brief uh, comments and opening remarks, and then we'll turn to the other panelists, and then we'll return to, to Mr. Sefkovic. Who is that? Can you open this? <laughs> yes, I can. I will open that. <laughs> there we go. Here we go. Um, so, oh, um, hello? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so before, yes, I would like to talk about uh, geopolitics. Uh, I would like to ask you a question about you talk, uh, you emphasize a lot of <clears throat> climate change. I wonder what uh, steps the EU Commission is doing to help Poland and Germany to shift away from coal. But it's a huge problem mm -hmm. there. Uh, that's kind of my first question. But um, otherwise, I'm, again, um, in, uh, uh, in the press lately, uh, there was um, information that EU Commission made uh, already official that uh, Nord Stream 2 is happening. Um, I don't know if it's a final decision. Uh, I don't know if we have fake news or real news. Uh, but if it's true, um, I think it brings um, a lot of questions to European Commission. Why? Um, well, uh, it will come, it makes uh, Gazprom, but I'm what I want to stress out that it's not only Gazprom, it's a joint venture between Gazprom and Winter Shell. Roughly speaking, it's like 50 50, um, 50, 50 uh, joint venture, and we're talking about upstream, midstream, and downstream. So, what European Commission is doing, you're creating this monopolist monster inside of EU that will bring on shore of Germany 110 uh, BCM. Now, Ironically, if EU knows or kind of like learned through these years how to deal with gas problem and how to keep it at bay, uh, I'm not sure that uh, EU actually knows how to stand up to Germany and to Wintershell and to this, uh, the major economy uh, in Europe. Um, and I have to tell you, it will be very hard. It's, it's a very successful marriage between, uh, join, um, between Gazprom and Wintershell. Uh, they are together, like the joint, uh, you know, ventures, like more than 25 years. So um, I personally don't see this beautiful blonde that will, you know, break up, uh, that is going to break up this marriage. Uh, so you're bringing this, uh, all this uh, massive 
um, volumes. Not me, definitely. Well, you, you, <laughs> not you, 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 you definitely. you bre- yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, bringing uh, all these massive volumes to uh, German uh, shows. <laughs> And then what will happen uh, is Gaspar and mostly Germany will be able, um, I'm not saying manipulate, but dictate the prices. Because I think here is very interesting thing what's happening. Uh, Gazprom just recently made all these concessions uh, in uh, antitrust uh, case that was uh, against him, uh, held by uh, Europeans. And it's very nice and sweet on the paper. And guess promising, of course, prices will be uh, transfer, um, transparent, and they are going to be transparent. But they will be um, uh, referred uh, to uh, prices, uh, the average prices, German border, France border, and uh, uh, Italy border, Italian border. Now, what uh, all these uh, Eastern European countries are doing, will their price will be um, counted and priced against uh, the borders of the uh, Western countries uh, because, you know, it's much shorter um, distance to come to, to Poland or to Czech Republic or to Slovakia. That's one question. Another question, Gazprom is saying, oh, yes, um, long-term contracts will stay. Um, okay, they will stay and they will be uh, oil priced, um, oil indexed. But then uh, other part uh, of other part of the gas uh, will come. It will be bounced by uh, uh, by uh, European hubs. But what hubs? German hubs. Again, there is no even mentioning on uh, of UK hub, which is the most liquid hub uh, in Europe. So Gazprom and uh, uh, Wintershell are going to bring gas to Germany, bounced it by its own hub, and then uh, disseminated in Germany uh, against uh, in all U- uh, European Union. I think it's really you know raises the question, mm-hmm. and I think here you need uh, at that point you need LNG gas just to balance it. Wonderful. Uh, I knew we would talk about geopolitics and get into North Sea too. So thank you for uh, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, we'll turn turn to John Elkind now uh, to hear from him. Thank you, thank you Tim, and uh, thank you to Vice President Shevchevich for uh, being here with us today. Um, I'd like to make basically three broad comments or touch on three uh, topics. Uh, one being. Um, an American's observation of this project of energy union that you have been describing, a second uh, on climate and clean energy leadership, and then a third, um, some thoughts about where there may be, or questions about where there may be opportunities Mm -hmm. for um, uh, continuing US-EU collaborations. Uh, First, I mean, I think in regard to the the energy union, um, it is important for, observers in, in this country, on this side of the Atlantic, to remember the, the complexity of the undertaking. Um, you referred to shifts in technology, objectives about um, uh, a decarbonizing world, and all of that uh, carries um, complexity and requirements of investment and so forth, but notwithstanding the fact that it was at first a coal and steel union, the idea of creating a truly functioning single market is something that is huge. And I think as Americans, we have a tendency to forget uh, the very uh, considerable tensions that arise all the time in jurisdictional matters between our Federal Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and our state uh, uh, utility commissions, which uh, very jealously guard their prerogatives uh, and and so forth. And the same one is seeing in, uh, in the European case uh, France worried about legacy investments in its uh, nuclear fleet, which is understandable, but then not achieving some of the uh, the uh, interconnection uh, objectives anytime soon, so it would seem. Uh, so the political element of this is, has been the thing that has always struck me, and I think it is uh, there is unfinished business, but the progress that has been made, particularly under this commission, mm-hmm. uh, and thanks in no small part to, to your leadership, um, has been huge. Um, On the climate and energy, excuse me, climate and clean energy um, uh, agenda, um, I I think it is uh, in a time when there are all sorts of very fundamental questions being asked 
uh, regarding national leadership in, in the United States, um, uh, I think it is uh, you know, a very, very tricky challenge, and I'd be interested to um, undiplomatically uh, elicit more uh, detail, if you're willing, about how uh, the EU and uh, your member states are thinking about that interaction um, with official Washington about uh, the, the climate issue. We're told that before the uh, G7 plus EU leaders summit, which comes uh, uh, late in May, that uh, one can expect a decision about whether the United States will stay in the Paris Agreement. Uh, and there are uh, many Americans, myself included, uh, who uh, would consider it to be a, a, a really serious mistake if, if that were not the case. Uh, of greater relevance than my opinion, perhaps, is that uh, expressed by the Secretary of State during his uh, confirmation hearings, the, the Secretary of Defense talking about um, impacts arising from a changing climate and what that means uh, even for the national security of the United States or global security. Um, you referred to uh, migration pressures arising. So any further thoughts on that would be uh, certainly of great interest to me. Mm -hmm. A third and final area that I'd like to comment on is, is the, uh, the, US, the, the transatlantic energy and climate agenda going forward. Uh, because um, even in a time when our federal government uh, is expressing a priority for America first, um, uh, a, uh, a phraseology that has certain historical echoes, not all of them uh, very pleasant. Um, it's, I, I think, the case that there are so many interlinkages, economic and academic and research uh, and policy interlinkages that that importance of continued transatlantic uh, engagement on energy and climate is huge. Um, one specific example, um, the entry of the United States into the position of being an exporter of liquefied natural gas, LNG, um, has been something, has been part of a broader uh, changing evolution of the, the energy landscape and out of the hundred cargoes uh, that have been dispatched from the first of the U.S. export facilities at Sabine Pass, uh, I'm told that 30 percent, um, excuse me, that, that uh, roughly 15 of them have gone to uh, Europe, including, including to Turkey, um, uh, with others going elsewhere as the arbitrage dictated. But this is yet another uh, new linkage. And I would be interested in your thoughts, uh, Marush, about other areas of priority where, notwithstanding some of the shifting views uh, from, from Washington, where there may be opportunities for continued and one hopes even deepened collaboration, whether that's in the carbon capture, utilization storage space, or in energy storage, or in certain policy arenas. Thank you. Thanks very much, John. It was great. Uh, then finally, Vijay. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, it's a pleasure to be on a panel with you, Vice President. Um, I think actually your comments on Africa were spot on uh, about leapfrogging and so on. I just had a few thoughts. Um, I think, uh, interestingly, you know, if you look at the last couple of decades of discussion on Africa, you know, generally they are about policy and governance issues or what I would call management issues, how to execute efficiently. And then the third thing is generally on financing. Okay. So, so, you know, the debate can be summarized in these three blocks. But I think one new dimension where suddenly I think we are seeing action, not a planned action, let's say from World Bank or EU or something, but actually something that is happening ground up is technology and innovation. And that is happening. So I think I almost see now that as the fourth pillar in addition to 
the other three pillars. And why I say that is that legacy settings like New York City, if we try to do some innovation, it's very hard. In fact, you know, my laboratory deployed first 16 mini grids in Africa six years ago. And the only reason we could deploy is because there was no legacy player. Mm -hmm. Uh, the mm -hmm. first mini grid being deployed in Brooklyn or something, you know, a lot of time. Right? So I think here, and, and by the way, uh, European uh, uh, electricity companies are taking note, NG, EDF, NL, EON, actually they are all partnering with innovators in Africa, not just as a way to do some corporate social responsibility, but actually to learn. Let me give you just one data point, you know. Uh, we, when we installed smart meters in California, it cost $300. It is now possible through in disruptive kind of innovation that that cost may come down to $30. Okay. It's, I am already, you know, working with Chinese suppliers at, you know, small volumes at that kind of price point. So. So that's one. Where the challenge is, I think, on the technology side is, the biggest challenge I see is small countries with lots of siloed systems. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the importance of information technology, software, smart payments, low transaction cost payment systems will grow. But there, I think, the skills, technical uh, receptivity, it, you know, when it comes to software is still dominated by the large players. You know, you still see the IBMs and Microsofts and all that in Africa. And, you know, can Africa really start, you know, and it's perfect thing. It's, you know, to learn for the youth to pick up those skills, you don't need fancy laboratories and chemistry sets. And, you know, so I think that may, uh, add to this innovation. So that's one. Um, the second thing I think uh, what EU has done, which is really to learn a lesson from, you know, even though if you are sitting, your comments may not uh, show that, that because you are in Europe, but I see Europe as a fantastic example of what energy integration can do. Okay. And, you know, just uh, especially, of course, the Nordic countries have two, two unique aspects. One is that they have huge amount of hydro storage in Norway, Sweden. So Norway, Sweden, Finland, you know, uh, Denmark together have 100 days of storage. In New York State, we have four hours, right? So it's very different. Now, that is very geographic. But the other thing is to have really bilateral flows. And I think, what can Africa learn from that? Because in the end also Africa, many countries, uh, but some countries have huge potential resource. It's not evenly spread out. You see strong hydropower in Central Africa, great uh, sort of gas, wind, geothermal in East, in West Africa, you see great sunshine. You know, so how can they benefit from each other? That is not happening, and it's as you. It is politically quite complex, but technologically, I think uh, it's uh, important. Now, other thing I want to say is that the lesson we learned from I mean, Germany and other European countries with feed-in tariffs on solar, the research is showing showing that that brought down the cost of solar. Right. The PV panel today, the latest quote I got was 36 cents a watt. This is a factor 10 from 10 years ago. And a lot of it was by creating the European demand. Right? Now, I see that there is a potential, you know, uh, with, with lack of gas networks with lack of coal other than Southern Africa. In Africa, I see a real uh, ability to bring that leadership together and see how, how, and how do you see the prospect of that? Because what is happening on a practical side is, 
uh, if you look at let's say world bank or african development bank they are trying to give low cost finance but on the execution side things are still uh, done by big uh, sort of high cost contractors what china seems to be doing is combining finance with execution so they are saying not only are we going to give you a loan to ghana but instead of the wire costing 40000 dollars a kilometer we will do it for you for 15000 what mm. I, i was just thinking what what's your thought on that because uh, that's uh, and uh, 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 finally just uh, you know i think your comment on de risking uh, and facilities for de risking i really appreciate and i think Uh, uh there you know uh, also i see the need for early stage technology development that bypasses the very difficult to change electric utilities i mean the utilities in india and africa are even harder to change if you can imagine because of their closeness to the political establishment mm -hmm. so that i'll stop there mm -hmm. and uh, uh, thank you that's excellent thank you vj um, so that's that's quite a list uh, <laughs> you, have, you have some you have, how much time do we have? You, you you have some time i thought right uh, <laughs> uh, let's let's see we uh, um we got quite a list you want to yeah you took notes, so you want to just get started and maybe i will i will start yeah. with uh, russia gazprom uh, uh, north stream 2 and uh, I thought that I would I would get get the question, so I didn't want to delve into it right at the beginning. And now I, I thought that probably I should have because I could have uh, clarified some of the uh, issues already at at the beginning. First, I would say uh, what I would say is that it's um, quite clear that uh, we are very important uh, uh, client for Russia. We are the biggest uh, energy importer on this planet. Uh, we are very predictable how much uh, energy uh, do we need how much we are going to import we are paying on time and we pay in in a hard currency and i think that uh, it's quite clear that uh, all this um is uh, affecting the russian uh, energy strategy in a way that they want to make sure that the market share on the european market would be um very solid uh, very 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 substantial uh, at the same time we know that russia is looking for the diversification of the export for, for the portfolio and i think that they understand very well that we are also looking for the diversification of suppliers because uh, uh, we just i would say i believe in the last uh, phase of uh, conclusion of the case where we uh, been investigating the gazprom for the uh, abuse of the dominant position on on um, on the market and uh, we clearly have seen that during this investigation uh, the the price differential between western and eastern countries uh, was quite substantial and actually the the countries in central eastern europe have been paying between 15 to 24% more for the gas despite as you rightly put in other closer uh, to to russia but the, the problem was that they didn't have that many alternatives from whom they could uh, buy the gas because there was not enough interconnections there was not uh, enough liquidity especially uh, especially in 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 the gas market so part of i would say the strategic uh, uh, priorities of the energy union was a diversification of the suppliers so therefore we are uh, working so hard to make sure that we will have caspian gas uh, in europe before 2020 Uh, therefore we adopted new lng strategy uh, which is uh, aimed uh, at uh, making sure that uh, europe as a, as i said because the energy importer would be very well placed uh, on uh, the global uh, lng market and uh, we are also doing our homework uh, meaning that we still need to build uh, i would say uh, two or three lng terminals one in kirk one in uh, in croatia one 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 in greece and and then um i think we are quite well set to have like geographical coverage of uh, the lng terminals where we need them and of course the second part of the homework is that we also have to make sure that uh, 
these LNG terminals are proper interconnected with all other uh, um, uh, pipelines uh, within Europe. So we can provide every single country in Europe. Now I'm talking also about uh, those countries from Western Balkans who want to be part of it because some of them they want. That they would have uh, alternative of at least three different sources of gas. So they would not be in that position that it's this offer or nothing. This offer or you freeze. So we, we want to make sure that each of them would have uh, uh, that possibility because in that case, of course, uh, you have much better competition on the market and you have uh, uh, much better uh, energy uh, security. So that's the, the, the overall approach and, and overall uh, strategy. Then, of course, we had uh, 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 we have uh, this uh, huge uh, political and security problem in the east of uh, Ukraine. Um, we had, uh, within that context, uh, very strong uh, announcements uh, coming, uh, uh, especially from from Gazprom about uh, the the Nord Stream uh, uh, two, which was in the aftermath of the cancelled project of the of the, of the South Stream. And uh, it was uh, made uh, in very unfortunate uh, connotation with the uh, importance uh, of bypassing Ukraine for different reasons. And um, of course, this uh, started uh, a very uh, comprehensive discussion within the EU, within the uh, European uh, uh, Commission. I will tell you what I would prefer, and I will tell you where we are, and also give you the, the latest on this uh, project. I would clearly prefer um, to have the comprehensive discussion with, uh, with Russia about how much gas do we actually need in Europe. Because we made our calculation, I would say, pretty clear that we would need something between 380 to 450 billion cubic meters by 2030. And uh, that's not only our calculation, it's like 10 forecasters more or less are coming to the same conclusion that we would need the same volume or maybe a little bit more. Of course, very often when I say this, we are criticized by the NGOs who say, but you know, we have all these renewables agenda, we have energy efficiency in place and so on and so forth. But we also are convinced that gas would gradually replace the coal, for sure in, in Germany and to Poland, I will come, uh, come in a second. <clears throat> that the gas would be, would be used much more in, in transport, especially in heavy duty vehicles and, and uh, in shipping. And the gas would uh, serve increasingly more as a balancing base load, uh, balancing energy to the more and more present uh, intermittent sources like, like solar and, uh, and wind. And of course, once we establish the case, this is how much gas do we need. So then, of course, I, I would also like then to have a look at uh, what is the current infrastructure for transporting the, the gas from, from Russia uh, to Europe. And why do we need uh, such a big overcapacities, uh, which really uh, uh, Nord Stream uh, would create? Because uh, we have a lot of discussions in, in Europe on many other things, but we have clear unanimity that if it comes to the transit to Ukraine, that there is unanimous... Uh, 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 unanimous understanding that this is a project of strategic importance for, for Europe and we just simply do not want uh, to lose this transit line. We do not want to jeopardize the transit through Ukraine and we do not want uh, to put uh, any kind of doubts also on the future of Yamal, which is another pipeline because uh, we cannot understand how we would be in a better situation if you would have Nord Stream route, you would have a Polish route, then you have Ukrainian route. Suddenly, from these three, two could be put out of business because there, there might be no commercial case for them. So we would have 80% of Russian gas going through through one route. We had the last summer, there was, I think, some kind of technical maintenance uh, um, on, on, on Nord Stream 1, and suddenly we saw how this Ukrainian uh, and Polish route had been very important. But it was just, just a technical maintenance. So you can always imagine different kind of... Uh, scenarios of the of the of the real world therefore i think we just simply really need to have a, um, a discussion that currently the capacities of uh, russian uh, uh, gas uh, transport network to europe are used at a little bit more than than 50 percent do we need to add additional uh, capacity uh, how much would it cost don't we risk that this uh, that uh, this could become stranded assets uh, in uh, in in the future 
And uh, then, of course, uh, uh, we are very clear about the fact that uh, um, uh, we do not like this uh, project from the polarization it brings to the discussion of the, our member states, into the polarization it, it, which brings uh, into discussing <laughs> energy matters between uh, EU and Russia. And as uh, our Juncker president said, we clearly prefer the pipelines which unite than which uh, they, they divide. So, therefore, we've been very clear that uh, we don't see this project to be in line with the energy union strategy, to never become the project of the, of the common, common interest. And we have, we have doubts about uh, the necessity to, uh, to build it. There we are on the legal front. And here it gets uh, uh, more complicated, and, I, and I'm sure that this would lead also to the uh, legislative uh, changes in the, in, in, in the future. Because uh, we have absolutely no doubt, and uh, we would uh, insist that everything what will be built onshore of the EU will have to fully comply with the European law. Unbundling, transparent uh, management, capacity allocation, third party access, everything what every single pipeline uh, operator must respect in the EU. We had uh, long discussions on the so called direct applicability of the third energy package. Uh, on the offshore uh, pipeline. And our legal uh, experts uh, had different opinion, but the legal uh, service uh, uh, says that uh, it's very difficult to enforce the third energy package on the, on the offshore pipeline if you don't have uh, active cooperation on, on the situation. At the same time, uh, we have clear preference uh, for the core principles of the energy uh, union uh, or energy gas law, we respect it, and we have absolute clarity on the fact that we need to do our utmost to avoid legal vacuum or the fact that this project would be built uh, on the basis of Russian law only in European territorial waters in the European exclusive zone. Therefore, the latest, which you probably haven't been informed because it's coming from the, from the last week when we've been uh, um, studying this even more carefully, and we got very precise questions from Nordic ministers uh, uh, how we see the project. So uh, we inform them and also inform our uh, EU, EU member states that we are going to, see, to seek mandate from the Council, meaning from the member states, uh, uh, to resolve uh, this collision of laws, the, the EU and Russia, and to avoid uh, the the, the, the legal vacuum by the negotiations. So we are going to ask the mandate for the agreement which we would like to negotiate uh, uh, with uh, Russia on how uh, 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 the, uh, this pipeline could be operated if built and what, of course, would be the legal principles and uh, legal, uh, legal requirements for such a pipeline. As an illustration, I just mentioned that there are several IGAs between Norway and quite a few European member states but where every single issue is covered. What happens with the pipeline bursts? What happens if the supply of gas is interrupted? What, what happens uh, if there is any natural disaster in the area? Who is liable? Who is paying for what? So that's uh, something which uh, I would say was done before. And uh, therefore, because we uh, couldn't uh, find a more appropriate uh, legal mean how to address this issue, therefore we want to get a mandate from our member states to negotiate uh, uh, with uh, Russia on uh, uh, this uh, uh, particular case. Investigation of Gazprom, as you rightly pointed out, hopefully we will, after a long investigation, come to a closure. There have been three issues. One was so-called ban on resales, meaning that when you bought the gas from Gazprom, let's say in uh, Poland or Slovakia, you've been not authorized to sell it, if, even if you didn't need it. So it was not like your own property, even though you bought it. Then, of course, the second issue, which was uh, uh, quite difficult, was unfair pricing. I was already re referring to this price differential. And third one was that in uh, at least two member states, uh, uh, there have been linkages between gas supplies and, and uh, construction of the, of the infrastructure. So we ne negotiated uh, with the Gazprom. They, they proposed their they commitments, their remedies, 
and they are now being market tested uh, with, uh, with European operators. This market test will last seven weeks. We will see what will be the reaction from the market, from the operators, and then we would adjust, uh, if necessary, uh, these commitments. We will, if everything goes fine, we will transpose this in the European law and uh, it will become obligatory on the Gazprom to behave according to these new rules. If there is a breach, there is no other way just imposing automatically the fine, which could go up to 10% of the turnover of Gazprom. So that's where we are with the investigation of, uh, of the uh, Gazprom uh, case. Mm -hmm. Of course, I think uh, uh, coming to the um, I would say the overall energy security, and that's my, uh, that was my message in Houston, that was my message to Secretary Perry, that was my, my message uh, uh, to Senator Barassa, that was my message in, a, in, a, in the White House. We are ready for American LNG, and I don't understand why there is still this uh, uh, authorizing procedure, which is <laughs> accelerated. I think it uh, now lasts only 45 days. I mean, uh, um, uh, I think that uh, LNG companies in Houston told me they are ready for the competition in Europe and we are ready to, to have more competition on our labor market because uh, we just uh, simply want uh, to have a best price, uh, best quality services and no strings attached when we are buying and, and, and paying for energy supplies. But I'm talking too long, and I'm sure that they wanted to interrupt. You're not, no, 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 you're not uh, talking too long. But there are a couple of questions from the other panelists that were raised, and I think we want to turn to those maybe, uh, and then yeah. we turn to the audience because I want to make sure people have time to ask questions. So maybe, um, so, so climate leadership, and John referred to this in particular with regard to the uh, the Paris Agreement uh, and the role that the U.S. may or may not play going forward. Any additional thoughts on that? Opportunities for transatlantic uh, cooperation. Uh, think of CCS and electricity mm. storage, for instance. Um, and then we, when we turn to, uh, to Vijay's uh, comments, uh, so how do we break through these yeah. siloed systems in African countries? How do we transfer lessons of European integration um, to uh, enhance integration in, in, parts, of, in parts of Africa? Um, uh, yeah, those were some of the... Maybe, of the maybe on, on first on, 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 on US. I mean, when I was in, um, in Houston, which, uh, I, you know, it's not like uh, the, uh, the Davos for, for, for energy, so there, uh, I would say there was a uh, several um, emotions. I would say <laughs> <laughs> skiing is not that good. That's true. The 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 the, the, the first one was of course the uh, expectation that uh, I would say uh, um, the new new policies would uh, uh, encourage more of a business development and. Uh, 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 more of uh, opportunities uh, for businesses in US and also overseas. At the same time, I have to say, when I talk to the big uh, energy companies, uh, I don't think that I met anyone uh, who was telling me that, uh, uh, that abandoning Paris Agreement was a good idea. And the case was, uh, I think there have been several uh, reasons for that, as, as I can assess. The first one was that many of uh, the CEOs have been sitting with me at uh, the CEO uh, summit, uh, which was taking place in, in, in Paris, uh, <laughs> where we've been also discussing how important the role of businesses is in, in this energy transition. Second, uh, I would say it's not only because of the corporate social responsibility. All these big companies uh, are, I mean, not all of them, but most of them are building very strong green divisions in US, uh, in Europe. And uh, as far as I understand, the solar industry is, has become very quickly number two employer. Mm -hmm. uh, in the United States as well. We in Europe uh, currently, I mean, we have something like 9 million people working in this green tech, green tech, energy efficiency uh, sector of the economy, and we expect that this would double by 2030. So that's, uh, it's a huge uh, uh, job creation potential because if you do energy efficiency measures, I mean, in, in, a, in a neighborhood, it's not some kind of... Uh, of international company. These are usually the SMEs, uh, local guys who are coming and, and, and fix your house, install the, I would say, home automation system, and we're actually creating a lot of jobs uh, uh, locally, and the family inside saves a lot of money on paying lower, lower, lower energy bills. And the energy companies realize that for the, in the future, already now, I would say, they, are not, they would not be selling energy. 
they would be selling service. Mm -hmm. They would be selling service to make sure that lights are on, heat is on, air cooling is on, but it must be done in much more, I would say, comprehensive manner in the, 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 with packages of services which would be sold and not just the energy as such. And the progressive companies understood it and they want, want to go in, 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 uh, in, uh, uh, in that direction. So when we discuss it uh, uh, in, uh, in Washington, D.C., with the Secretary Perry and uh, also with Mr. Gary Cohn in, in the White House, uh, um, I, it was quite clear that if it comes uh, uh, to the, the question of uh, Paris Agreement, it, I, was, I was here three, four weeks ago, the uh, discussion was not advanced to that level yet. But uh, it was also quite, uh, quite clear that uh, they've been studying very carefully the uh, job impact. Uh, Secretary Perry was very clear that he sees a lot of potential for cooperation, research and innovation. With Jonathan, I think we've been uh, uh, working together to make sure that, for example, Argon Lab close to Chicago and our uh, lab in, in East Prime, Italy would work together on, on storage, on electric vehicles, on uh, uh, transmission, smart grids, and so on and so forth. So this was clearly very much uh, supported by, by the Secretary of Energy. And then in, 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 in the White House, I mean, uh, we discussed a lot, you know, what to do with uh, carbon capture and storage, carbon capture news, what kind of new business models we, uh, we are trying to develop in Europe, as, as it was rightly asked, for the carbon intensive regions. Mm -hmm. And I think here we need uh, two aspects for that. The first one is a political, that we have to be very clear also in, in Europe, in, in Poland, in my country, in Czech Republic, that uh, we are not leaving these people behind. We are not abandoning these mining towns uh, because these uh, uh, people have been working very hard for a, for a long decade. It was very proud uh, profession and it's a very tough job to be a miner. And I understand that if somebody comes and tells them, okay, we don't need you anymore, we're just closing this down and we don't mm -hmm. care what happens to you, of course these people would be very concerned and, and very unhappy. So what we are doing right now is uh, we are learning from the examples where we had the successful transition already accomplished. Northern Westphalia, uh, different uh, Belgian uh, uh, regions, uh, the Haute de France, uh, uh, where they, they managed uh, to, to do this right. And we have uh, quite a few good examples of what can be done, but I think we have to come with a message. We are ready to help, we are ready to work with local authorities, with national government, we are ready to look for different kind of investment and financing. What kind of new business model we can develop uh, for these uh, regions? If you would find that understanding, yeah, let's work together on the transition, then it's much more easier. But I know that uh, with Poland, uh, this would be uh, more complicated, and uh, the reason for that is that they see coal as a security issue. Coal is here, we don't have to import it. We don't have to import oil, we don't have to import gas, we have it here. So, uh, therefore, I think uh, that, uh, and, and, and I know from the research and innovation point of view, we had few demonstration plans so far. None of them was the technology which was economical enough mm -hmm. on the carbon capture and storage, carbon capture new. So. They, you, they can, uh, that we can, they can use uh, that the natural resource in, in much more, uh, uh, much more environmental uh, uh, way. And, and cooperation for transatlantic relationship. I'll have uh, at lunchtime. I'll have meeting with uh, um, EU US Chamber of Commerce. And I think that we need to repeat it uh, quite frequently here that our transatlantic economic relationship is super robust. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I don't see two major economies like the American and European are more intertwined. Mm -hmm. Europeans are investing 80% of foreign direct investment in the United States. Mm -hmm. Seven million jobs in the United States have been created by European companies. Two million additional jobs depend on exports of American goods and services to Europe. And I can continue on and on and on. And we can, of course, compare the, the trade deficits, uh, which one year look in one way, then services deficits, which are, which are opposite. So, I mean, this is just, uh, I, I would say, such a huge, uh, I would say, uh, value chain in many, in, in many, in many aspects. And therefore, I think we, we should try to look how we can 
cherish, develop, uh, nurture that relationship because uh, not only the e EU and the US benefited from this very close uh, uh, economic uh, uh, cooperation, but I would say a lot of other very important international uh, uh, economic economic players. So I think we have to remind ourselves uh, of, the, of these numbers, of that uh, cooperation which we have, uh, so that our relationship is not only uh, based on values, on security, but on very, very robust uh, trade and economic fundamentals. And that's something I think what what uh, I see as a very important uh, um, uh, contribution also for our for our future discussion. And, and Vijay, and thank you very much for bringing this uh, this very specific aspect of uh, uh, working uh, in in uh, in in Africa. I think if you talk about big energy companies and incumbents, we have the same in Europe. <laughs> they know how to talk to the government, and and I would say maybe to a lesser extent, uh, sometimes when we are trying to build the interconnector between the two countries, suddenly you start to have some problems, and then you really look in the bottom of it, so you realize that there is one company which is very much worried that if the interconnector is built, that you are opening the market, what will happen? Maybe they'll have a better price, and so so they are scaring the prime minister and energy minister. So I mean, we, we have we have the same, and therefore I think we need to have that the approach that we will be really opening opening. Uh, the, uh, the, the the fragmented uh, national markets to uh, create the European one. So in Africa, I, I presume it's the same, in same much issue. more much yeah. more uh, uh, yeah. uh, concise and condensed uh, condensed uh, uh, way. And therefore, what I think uh, what we really should do is, as you said, uh, to clearly put the focus on uh, collaboration with the with the with the local leaders local communities sometimes going going straight uh, to the rural communities with a uh, ready made uh, uh, product yeah. and show that what this can do to the local community because then as with air pollution also here the the public pressure would be huge uh, look what you can do with i would say uh, this new technology how can you improve the system mm -hmm. so why are you preventing this from from coming this to us mm -hmm. and then of course the the financing of this, uh, we also would need to have a fresh look because I think we are at the stage in Europe and probably in Africa that it's quite clear, especially after the crisis we had a few years ago, that we cannot cover everything by the public money. No. no. We clearly need to restart uh, mm -hmm. the private sector activities, create mm -hmm. conditions for them, new frameworks, to be ready to the risk some of the, the financing and to bring the private initiative, private interests, local, international, mm -hmm. To, to get uh, the good proje project uh, uh, realized uh, in, uh, in 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 Africa, and uh, and if we really can achieve what we all agreed in a sustainable energy for all, that uh, we would double uh, uh, the renewables in Africa, we would double the energy efficiency, would provide basic access to electricity to all, for yeah. for all Africans. I mean, that would just simply be the the best thing we can do for for all African continent. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks a lot. Um, so, you put an, an awful lot on the table. We had, had you talk a lot too, so I want to give you give you a minute uh, to recover, um, uh, and want to give the audience uh, obviously an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, there's a lot of different topics on the table. A microphone has been set up right there in the middle. Um, if any of you wants to uh, ask a question, uh, please um, please state your name and your affiliation. Um, and thank you for joining. Hello. Please go ahead. Hello, Mivi um, Sefkovic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the panel. Valeria Dallatore, I'm from NYU, uh, the Center for Global Affairs. So I had a question regarding US LNG. You said Europe is ready for US LNG, and, and it is. I mean, we have a 33% or 30% uh, utilization rate or regasification capacity. But, but also the United States is ready. Chenier has declared that 50% of their liquefaction capacity by 2020 can actually go to Europe, will go to Europe. But there are some questions that are unresolved. And the um, first question is, well, competing with Russian gas, it has to be, price has to be around 4, maybe 3.5 million British thermal units. Second of all, you've said it, how much gas does Europe really need? How much demand will grow, but it won't grow exponentially. It will be a very slight, slight growth. And at the same time, the Southern Gas Corridor is, is, uh, is coming online, hopefully by 2020 with TAP. Uh, and Croatia will have their LNG uh, terminal. So how, since Europe is ready, and the United States is bringing on uh, 12 trains, I think, at least, by 2020, and could export to Europe, but the arbitrage says it would be better to export it, of course, to the Asian markets for, for better returns. How 
is the energy union accounting for this? How could it help some? Could it put? Some, I don't know. It's an idea. Some quotas maybe like for in order to instead of buying gas from Russia to wean off a little bit and say, look, let's find a way to purchase from the United States. Let's find a way to deal with the United States better on this front to help you know increase energy security. Okay, thank you. So should thank we? You. Yeah. Should what? What is the outlook? Can you say more about this? And should we move to a more regulated model? I guess is the question. I, I think that if it comes to the uh, to uh, to the to the LNG. Um, uh, the truth is that uh, currently we are using our uh, capacities uh, uh, by, I don't know, some between 20 to 30 percent. And I, I think the major reason for that is not only the price, but also the fact that uh, uh, some of these uh, uh, terminals, especially the huge cap capacity of Spain, it's, it's not interconnected uh, with, the, with the rest of Europe. So we still need to build it interconnected through France. We're working on it. It's not easy, but uh, I believe it will be done. And uh, then we need uh, some more interconnectors within the Europe so that uh, the LNG could really feed uh, in a way that anybody can can uh, can uh, profit uh, from that. And uh, I think that this would also open uh, the, the the new markets for gas because uh, the Western Balkan countries, some of them which have not been gasified before, are seriously thinking about it because I mean again air pollution because of the fact that gas is cheaper and. Uh, it's better combination with the uh, with the renewables. So there there would be also I would say the newcomers who are not within the EU but they are in our neighborhood who would like to use more uh, more gas and or replace coal or simply uh, work with uh, with the less uh, uh, carbon intense uh, uh, fuel. And um, um, concerning the quotas, I think that uh, uh, we in Europe we, we very much believe in um, in in the in the market. And uh, we believe in um, uh, gas hub pricing, and um, and um, we are putting a lot of emphasis in the current uh, legislation, which is being discussed in the member states and the European Parliament, uh, on uh, uh, the rules which would improve uh, the security uh, of supply, meaning uh, transparent pricing, gas hub pricing, uh, solidarity clause, which would uh, uh, require that uh, the countries would help each other in, in the case of crisis. And we are also pushing for the transparency of the commercial contracts. And that, of course, it's quite contentious. It's not uh, I mean, easy easy to achieve, as, especially for all suppliers who I think are supplying in one particular country more than 40% of the, of the supply. So this is, I would say, the set of rules which I think will really um, create create new, new standards and uh, uh, I think uh, would also uh, create the new uh, opportunities for the LNG exporters for the US also to look at, at, the, at the EU market. I think it's very difficult to predict where, we'll, where we will be with the uh, uh, prices and with the situation on the market when the US will become uh, number one or number two of LNG exporters uh, together with Australia and, and current big um, uh, number one, Qatar will slip slide up. So it's it's just show that there will be much more gas on 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 the LNG market. I still think that most of it would go most probably uh, to Asia, but I think that we could have very very solid share of the of the uh, LNG in Europe. But it would of course require that we will complete uh, our network uh, in our member states, and at the same time that. That the LNG industry in the US would be ready for that uh, competition uh, with the pipeline gas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just to uh, uh, add on and do some shameless self-promoting, the uh, a number of a number of my colleagues, Jason Bordoff and Akos Laws, uh, wrote a number of papers. I think the last one was from November of last year. Do I get that right? Yeah, mm -hmm. um, uh, about US LNG and what role it may or may not play going forward. So I'd, I'd recommend you, if you haven't seen them already, um, uh, turn to our website and find them there. Yes, the gentleman right over there, please. Uh, good morning. Uh, Albert Golson, Indo-Brazilian Associates. We specialize in uh, commodities, particularly oil and, um, and gold. Um, some big elections are coming up in Europe, particularly in France, starting um, um, April 23rd, I believe. Um, I haven't read th that much about um, Marine Le Pen, specifically in terms of what her energy policies would be if she gets elected. Of course, she's discussed many other items, but I haven't read anything on energy, how cooperative would France be under her leadership, and what are um, Europe's, how should I say, contingency plans should she um, win the elections? 
That's easy one, and you, you, you love this straightforward approach in the US. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, of course, I mean, we, we had, uh, as, as you rightly pointed out, a series of very important uh, elections. Uh, uh, we had the, the Netherlands. Uh, in the end, uh, the result was, uh, was quite, quite uh, positive, and it was a very, very turbulent uh, campaign as well. Now, of course, we have France, and then uh, to close off, uh, uh, we have uh, we have Germany. These are the three big ones. In in, in between, we had Bulgaria, and we, I think we have mm -hmm. several more EU, EU, EU member states. But of course, with the uh, with the prospect of Marie Le Pen, um, uh, I, I I I hope uh, that uh, uh, other more youthful candidate uh, would would prevail uh, in the end. Uh, because Emmanuel Macron is uh, the politician who is uh, clearly pro-European. Uh, he knows his briefs, he knows how the euro operates, and I think it would be a huge contribution to the future of France and to the consolidation of, of the EU. Because I think if, uh, uh, if we would uh, hypothesize about uh, Marie Le Pen, I think we would have much bigger problem than the energy cooperation. I mean, because she, I mean, uh, it's quite clear she, she wants to leave the Eurozone, she, she uh, wants to leave the EU eventually, so I mean we like these exit words now, so she's for Frexit. And, uh, and, and, uh, and we of course hope that it will, it will not go in that way, and I think that it will not be uh, that straight, uh, straight forward in France, even so France is uh, uh, going through the very long period of uh, quite arduous uh, um, uh, crisis, recession, and, and, and the recovery, which is not bringing uh, that much jobs as also the current president was, uh, was hoping for. The, the structural reforms will, will have to be accelerated in France, and there is a lot of, a lot of things which, uh, which, have to be, which have to be done. But uh, if you do them, I would say in that uh, proactive, uh, uh, pro-European and uh, uh, pro, I would say, important role of France state of mind then actually it will, it will make a big big service uh, uh, to such an important country like France if on other ways you would be looking for some kind of retreating back tricking closing in I mean in today's globalized uh, world you cannot hide uh, from anyone uh, you are within Europe you are uh, having borders with all your neighbors so I think that would be the the, the, the huge the huge setback so I think that uh, uh, we'll have much more serious uh, 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 discussion in, in, in that case. And just one word on, on, on France. I think that actually in, uh, if it comes uh, to energy transition, the, the current government actually did enormously a lot. I mean, they adopted for the first time uh, so-called transition law where they set very clear parameters with a very long uh, uh, vision and they touched also nuclear energy and they uh, promoted renewables. So it's something which, I mean, uh, was not traditional feature of how the France is looking at energy policies. And they also are uh, much more open uh, to uh, the internal European market. Of course, it's very strong, I would say, uh, uh, national supervision element, but they are really moving in, uh, in, in, in that uh, uh, direction. And they've been absolutely essential. And without the uh, French uh, diplomatic power, we would never agree uh, the Paris Agreement in Paris. I mean, all that uh, efforts they put in together, the close cooperation with us uh, in, in the EU, joint missions uh, uh, across the world. I was uh, touring together with Ségolène Royal, the, the, the African countries, we were promoting the the, the deal in Paris, so they really did uh, uh, a lot, and they, we owe them a huge, huge thank you for uh, for, for Paris Agreement. So, uh, so what I want to say uh, is that uh, f uh, it was a very difficult period for uh, for France, but I believe that with the uh, new leadership, we can see f France uh, really developing again, again very, very quickly. But uh, the first thing which we need uh, to have is a good result in the French elections. We'll know that uh, in a little over, yeah, about two months, I guess, we will, we will know more. Um, other questions, please? Um, if not, yeah, okay, please. Uh, 
Um, Will Persing, I'm a graduate student at the Harriman Institute for Russian Eurasian East European Studies. So my question is related to um, the European Energy Union's relationship with Ukraine and where they see the future of that going. Since the start of the war in the Donbass, Ukraine has shifted most of its energy supply away from Russia towards Europe, but all of that gas is still, in the end, Russian gas that's back-channeled from Europe. So what do you see as the future for European involvement in Ukraine? Yeah. Thank you. Well, I think that uh, also Jonathan can, can help me on this one because we've been uh, working on that uh, uh, already for quite some time, and there have been the moments where uh, we had uh, phone calls early in the morning or very late in the evening because uh, it was a harsh winter and not everything was always always settled. But I think that if we look at it uh, where we started, when the first trilateral protocol was, was signed, where we found that solution about part of the debt of Ukraine towards Russia and uh, the conditions under which uh, the uh, Russian gas would be sold uh, uh, to Ukraine and then uh, when that a uh, very important technical solution was found about these reverse uh, flows from, most importantly, from Slovakia, because it's, uh, that's the biggest one, 40 million uh, per, uh, per day. Then uh, also the Polish one and the Hungarian one. Then I think we started to really charter new, I would say, energy map of uh, Ukraine. Uh, because of the tensions which is clearly there uh, between between uh, two countries, Ukraine very much wanted to uh, make sure that uh, they can be supplied from uh, the, the Western direction. We can argue uh, where the molecules are coming, mm -hmm. and most of them, as you rightly pointed out, would be uh, from Russia. But the fact is that according to the European rules, you can you can buy the gas from the gas hubs. You can buy the gas from the from the Norway, and uh, this is more or less the swapping uh, accounting accounting operations. And uh, with exception, I would say of the, of the last uh, winter, the 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 price the uh, the Ukrainians can get from gas hubs in Europe uh, been lower uh, than the price they could get according to the the formula. Uh, which was in the contract between NAFTA Gas and Gazprom, and that situation uh, has changed. Uh, I think towards the winter for for a couple of uh, for a couple of weeks, but this time, I mean, uh, we were not able to agree on one particular issue, which uh, then didn't allow us to to proceed with the uh, with the conclusion of the third uh, trilateral uh, um, uh, protocol. When you ask me where I see uh, the future, at first, I think Ukraine has to accelerate uh, the reform process. I would say in all aspects, uh, I think in energy, they did enormously a lot. They are not always getting credit uh, or full credit for that because they liberalized uh, the prices. Uh, they uh, now have uh, appointed uh, uh, the regulator according to the uh, EU rules. They are uh, I think now debating the parliament uh, electricity law. They uh, are going to create the energy efficiency uh, fund, and they are also looking for the investors which could bring experience in how to bring, I would say, this uh, European standards in operating the, the transit uh, uh, pipeline, but also how to bring the investors to increase the extraction of gas from from the resources in uh, in Ukraine. So I'll just give you the few figures and uh, you will see what kind of uh, future Ukraine might, might have. Mm -hmm. If Ukraine would have the Polish energy efficiency standards, I'm not talking about Sweden, I'm talking about Poland, Slovakia, the Central Europeans. So they would save in one year that much energy as is consumed by Spain. So they would be almost immediately energy exporter. If uh, they uh, would uh, uh, increase uh, uh, the extraction of gas, which I understand is still possible, but because of the, uh, these different prices which have been used in Ukraine, there was no real incentive for the investors to come and invest more in the gas extraction. They can, they can extract quite significantly. Uh, uh, more uh, of uh, of the gas, and then of course, uh, if uh, they uh, would uh, continue 
uh, with uh, with the reform policies which which they said they they really could be uh, with a reasonable period of time i mean five to ten years less and less dependent on energy uh, imports and uh, they could be or uh, i would say uh, a neutral uh, position between import and export or they could even become exporters a lot would depend how quickly they would be with reforms what kind of regulatory stability they can offer to the foreign uh, foreign investors and uh, what they will do on the energy uh, energy efficiency front in the households but also in uh, in, uh, in, um, in 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 the industry and uh, then of course we have uh, we've been just discussing quite sensitive issue uh, of of coal then of course uh, they have very strong uh, nuclear power plant stocks so all these are the areas where we cooperate uh, very closely uh, with the Ukraine, sharing the know-how, offering the financial assistance to make sure that uh, all these sensitive pieces of technology are operating in an appropriate manner. And as you know, we, we signed a very uh, important agreement uh, with, with Ukraine and we are ready to cooperate uh, uh, with our Ukrainian partners as closely uh, as it would be possible. Wonderful. Thank you. John, do you have additional thoughts on that or would you want to? Yeah, I think the vice president has covered it very well. I, I, the, the, the Ukrainian story ends up being known kind of in the popular understanding as a natural gas story, but it is a whole system story. And in particular, the, um, the supply of anthracite for the existing coal fired power fleet um, uh, is substantially reliant on supplies from the two eastern oblasts that are that are occupied by Russia uh, or by uh, forces aligned with Russia. So it's a there's a significant uh, complication there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we are we have run over time. I want to give the panelists uh, a, a minute if they have some fi final thought they want to share um, and then we'll we turn to you once more. OK, and then we'll let you we'll let you go. Uh, thank you. Do you, have, do you have one final thought you want to share? Oh. I actually I really um, think that uh, the picture you you know you painted it's very rosy and I liked it, um, and I think uh, you uh, you made considerable progress in terms of in terms of uniting all the energy systems and uh, gas specifically. Uh, what I wanted to add that uh, yes you're right that uh, Gazprom made all these concessions in terms of um, uh, allowing to. Uh, reselling uh, reselling gas, but as we see, it's happening de facto. So my point was that all these conce concessions, they're basically on the paper and they're very useful for Gazprom because he legislatively confirms mm -hmm. that what what is happening de facto. Okay, thank you. Vijay, you have a final thought you want to? No, in fact, I uh, one of the comments Vice President made, I just want to amplify and echo that bringing in more private financing in Africa will actually force a healthy debate on what is the optimal role of public finance. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a good thing because that will, you know, when it is only public, it creates certain distortions. Mm -hmm. So I think and uh, it's not a question, but I just want to actually Compliment that comment you made, um, and it has many benefits. Yeah, thank you. An important reminder. Um, John, you want to? Just a one-liner that the um, uh, you commented, Maros, on the on the the coal transition that is happening, and uh, in Europe, um, of course, it's not only in Europe. And uh, uh, in the United States, uh, we saw this uh, uh, very considerable sense of certain parts of our country feeling like they've been left behind. Um, and uh, it seems to me that this is an important area for focus uh, and maybe one where Colombia might be able to, uh, to, to play a role on, on some of the successful cases, uh, because whether one is talking about the Eastern Landa of, of Germany or about Poland mm -hmm. or about um, West Virginia or about the coal producing regions in China, um, the fate of those communities potentially is a very considerable headwind delaying what happens uh, in the climate space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. another important, important reminder. I couldn't agree more. Um, 
you've been very generous with your time. We'd be remiss if you didn't get the last words. <laughs> if you want, please, a final No, word. thank you. Thank you very much also for, for this discussion, for the interest and for your kind in invitation. I think on, uh, yeah, I mean, the Gazprom is a big player. They will, they will, I'm sure, remind, uh, remain a very, very important player, very big player. And uh, therefore, I think that uh, on all these very important uh, energy-related uh, issues, on infrastructure, supplies, or uh, uh, market uh, market share, that uh, uh, we would uh, we would need uh, uh, more intense exchange of views, um, more transparency, and uh, also the uh, uh, feeling that uh, the the Europeans that treated as a uh, very important customer mm -hmm. and this very important customer as i said we want the best price highest quality of service and no political strings attached when we when we buy energy and i think therefore i i'm sometimes joking with my uh, russian partner tell them look you know uh, how how come we don't have all these discussions with Norway? <laughs> so, 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 so that's a bit of an anecdotal uh, reference to how complex uh, the relationships uh, in this uh, area are. Then on um, uh, on the private uh, financing, you're absolutely right, and I think that uh, uh, we need to make sure that uh, this low carbon transition will be now accelerated and fueled by the by the private interest, by the business cases, which what. Push it forward by generating the uh, the revenue by the modernizing potential they will bring because in that case of course it, it it would be much faster and it would be done much more efficiently. Just one also piece of uh, uh, advertisement we just uh, uh, agreed with uh, Bertram Picard. This is the gentleman who who flew around the globe mm -hmm. in his solar impulse mm -hmm. electric plane and he's real visionary in this case and. And I like to have a Facebook chat uh, chat uh, with him because it's guaranteed that there will be hundreds of thousands of viewers watching it, and I know that it's not because of me. So he, <laughs> so he really brings a lot of a lot of interest uh, into this topic, and uh, we agreed that uh, we will help him to come up before next COP uh, in Poland with one thousand energy solution, uh, which uh, would be interested interesting for private sector mm. so they would not need subsidies they would not need mm. uh, uh, some public public financing so that this would be energy solutions which would be interesting for private entrepreneur to use to install which would be driving right. the, the, the 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 modernization of the, of the system and we promised we would measure it we would test it we would give our opinion we mm -hmm. think that these technologies mm -hmm. are working and that's something which, of course, would be beneficial for the for the global global uh, community. And uh, carbon intensive regions, I, I totally uh, agree with with Jonathan. We simply uh, cannot overlook the, this issue. We are talking about the real people, real community, real regions, and communities which have been once extremely important. They contributed to to the economic yeah. development of our of our countries, and, and and they deserve fair treatment. And therefore, I think we need to collectively. Uh, uh, reflect uh, what is the best approach. I'm sure that for each community it would be different, but we have certain set of uh, examples, the experience we got, how this was done, what could be the alternative business model, what could be the uh, uh, social programs uh, we could propose, what, what would be the needed reskilling, what we can do with the local educational systems to prepare the community for the, for the new future. But I think what is the more, most important thing we have to show active interest that we, we we want to be part of the solution we we want uh, you to be on board we don't want to leave you behind and we want to find the the, the solution which would be future oriented or not backward oriented and i know that it's much easier to be said than to be done but i think without solving this issue we mm -hmm. would as, as as you said have uh, very big headwinds because we will have mobilized uh, and scared communities who would, who would uh, fear the future Thank you very much. Tim. Thanks very much. Um, uh, on that note, we're going to end. Uh, I want to thank you all for being here and for your uh, for staying with us, joining us. Um, um, as I said earlier, I think this this video, the, the recording will be uh, uh, will be available on our website in a couple of days, um, and then you can also subscribe to our podcast series, which I would encourage you to do. You'll find a podcast there later on uh, with Vice President Sefcovic as well. Um, uh, this is uh, one event in a series. I would uh, just flag one of them for you next week, Thursday, I believe, uh, is the Columbia Global Energy Summit. Uh, I would highly, highly recommend that you join us. 
Um, so please join me in thanking the panelists, uh, uh, in, uh, and in particular, obviously, uh, Vice President Sefcovic for joining us here at Columbia. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you.